Hi there. Um, you can see I'm upstairs again so I don't bother my family. And I'm back with the giant rat of Sumatra or pirates galore. And we left off last time with chapter five and we discovered that shipwreck uh, didn't need to save Captain Gallows. He was very well had the had the pirates very well in hand um, and saved himself and now has decided he's going to retire in california and buy a ranch and he's asked shipwreck to come and meet him because he's got some special request or plan for shipwreck maybe um, and that's where we left off so we're going to read chapters six and seven today chapter six is called containing one surprise after another and we have a very cool picture of the bowsprit the front of the ship let's see if i can do that right with the giant rat on it so here we go the captain's cabin stretched the width of the ship with aft windows set at a slant and overlooking the water, right? So the captain's cabin is like this big wide cabin at the, at the end of the ship. I stood at the door and cleared my throat. <clears throat> I forgot, the captain said, not bothering to notice me. You said you were an American, come in. I stepped through the doorway. A breeze was blowing through the cabin and it smelled of seaweed. So what shall I do with you, American? Are you homesick? A little, only a little. I was never homesick. Yes, sir. I was once a cabin boy. I said nothing. Amazed, eh? Every pound and noisy frog was once a pollywog. Oh, sorry. Every proud and noisy frog was once a pollywog. San Diego has always had the hide trade, ships coming and going. So it was easy for me to run away to the sea. I was only a little older than you. My first voyages were to China, then to England. It was a hen ship. I had heard about hen ships. It meant the captain had kept his wife aboard. That grand lady saw a spark in me and decided to teach me to read and write. When we got to London, she put me in school. Don't I talk like Shakespeare himself? The captain burst out laughing. I found it difficult to look up. I couldn't imagine why the ship's master was telling me all this, or how the man had gone from Shakespeare to piracy. As if reading my mind, Captain Gallows leaned forward and lowered his voice. Don't wonder what I am doing aboard the giant rat of Sumatra. I will tell you. It is difficult to be a poor Mexican. So I became a rich Mexican. I didn't know whether to smile or let the remark go by me. Was the captain so exalted that he didn't have anyone aboard he could talk to? What well, was that the way it was with ship's masters who held the power of gods? Talking to a cabin boy was talking to thin air, wasn't it? Did he really care what I thought of him? I detected a spark in you, continued the tall Mexican. It appears that you're going to find yourself beached in this sleepy little pueblo for a while. Leave that to me. If I were to have taught you to read and write, just imagine. You might grow up to be another Captain Gallows. So he's saying you're stuck in this sleepy town. You remember Pueblo is the Spanish word for town or, or village. If, if I were to have taught you to read and write, just imagine, he says, right? I can already read and write, sir. Blimey, is there nothing left remarkable beneath the visiting moon? He exclaimed. It struck me as something he'd got out of a book. Was that what Shakespeare sounded like? But you still have the misfortune to be American. Captain Gallows began pacing the cabin, ducking his head to avoid the lantern hung from the ceiling. The news ashore is that Mexico is at war. I stood unmoved, looking at the captain. I was sorry that there was a war, but what had that to do with me? Soon I'd find a passage home. We are at war with the United States, the captain added. Oh, my gaze faltered. With the United States? Did that mean at war with, with me, Edmund Amos Peters? And how near was the war? There were certainly no cannons booming over this quiet San Diego Bay. Now there was a really big 
reveal just then, right? Did you catch it? We haven't known who this boy is other than that they call him Shipwreck. But now we got a hint. Did you hear his name? Edmund Amos Peters, apparently. News travels slowly, remarked Captain Gallows. Fighting began weeks ago. It has not yet reached here. Why would Mexico attack the United States? Spoken like a patriot, but it is the United States that has invaded Mexico. The captain turned and bent to stare out the stern windows. You won't see any ships out there flying your flag. This is Mexican port. Trade with Boston has stopped. And the devil, as the devil would have it, shipwreck, you are not going to find a passage home from here. My heart tightened. My plans were turning to ashes. I could think of nothing to do but stare at my feet. How long was I going to be stuck in this confounded Mexican village? You may be regarded as an enemy foreigner, said the captain. War is bound to breed suspicion of suspicion and craziness. I am told that a militia is forming to battle the Americans. I think you'd better stick close to me, eh, amigo? Enemy foreigner? I was too dumbfounded to speak. I felt a little frightened. Couldn't I escape somehow to the United States? How far was it? A thousand miles? Two? Where was it? Beyond Texas somewhere? too far to walk. Meanwhile, you can do me a service, said the captain. Ashore, they tell me that law has broken down. Around every bend in the road, there is another bandit or cutthroat. My rancho lies almost half a day's ride north of here. I am going to trust you with a great secret. I will be traveling with something of amazing value. Look. Suddenly, as if he had plucked them out of the thin air, the captain held large green stones between his fingers, oh, between the fingers of each hand. They flashed and glowed like cold stars. Shipwreck, do you know what these are? You know what they are, right? I stared at the stones. I knew nothing about gems, except that they were bright and flashing. Green rocks? Trashy rocks, eh? Ah, uh, but what trash? These are emeralds. Two of them fat as walnuts. Gaze at them, cabin boy. Can you guess where they came from? I think so. Tell me. The eyes of the giant rat? Exactly, the captain exclaimed. How cunning of the captain before me. He told everyone that they were mere bits of glass. What safer way to protect them from thieves, yes? But no sparkling stones could fool the eyes of the waterfront thief in Hong Kong who gouged them out. Behold, lad, you are indeed gazing at the stolen eyes of the giant rat of Sumatra. I looked at them again. They seemed to flash lights of their own in the cabin shadows, like the lightning bugs I remembered back in Boston. A smile flickered across the captain's face. I had hardly been the ship's master a year when word reached me that a Malay thief was trying to sell a pair of great emeralds across the water in Macau. We set sail and I found him. I might have strangled the scoundrel on the spot, but he had a wife and three children with him. What could I do? So I bought the gems, fair and square, with gold from my private account, and they became mine, no? It's these green treasures worth a ship's cargo that our one-armed friend Mr. Ginger got wind of and came after. Whether others in my crew have similar schemes, I cannot guess. But these green eyes are no longer safe in a pouch around my neck, eh? They will be safer in your hands. I was startled. Mine? Who will suspect there's anything of value in the possession of a cabin boy? No one. I shook my head. No, sir, I lose things. Like what? Well, didn't I almost lose my life? The captain playfully lifted an eyebrow. 
but your life was a trifle and these, these are emeralds. That's a funny line. Your life wasn't worth anything, but the emeralds really are, right? Well, what if I run away with them? Run where? You are trapped, you know? I will have to trust you. I looked again at the gems. Those two confounded stones in my pocket were going to weigh a ton. Then I gave a shrug. Well, if I lose them, it'll be your funeral. No, shipmate, it will be your funeral. With a sailmaker's needle, the captain sewed the emeralds on, into the bottom hem of my baggy blue coat. Only after I left the, the cabin did I pause to realize that Captain Gallows had shown uncommon courtesy. He had not once reminded me that I owed a thundering great favor. The giant rat of Sumatra had troubled to pluck me from the sea. So I could trouble myself to walk around with a fortune in gems in the hem of my coat. So you get that, I hope. He's saying, really, he owed his life to this captain and the captain didn't even mention that. He just asked, can you hold on to these for me? So what do you think? Is that a good deal for shipwreck for our friend Edmund? Or do you think you would have begged to not be in charge of two very valuable emeralds? That was chapter six. Here is chapter seven with an interesting picture in which a pile of rubble bursts apart. And what jumps out? So there's our pile of rubble. Let's see what jumps out. The captain's rancho spread from the sea cliffs to the bright mustard haze of foothills rising to the east. Together with a stout city official in a black frock coat and dusty boots, the captain stood on the cliff top studying an ink drawn map of the property. Waiting with Trot and Puka Puka, I watched from the nearby shade of the rambling adobe house, abandoned and silent. The men came armed for trouble on the roads with knives and wooden belaying pins from the ship. I tried to ignore the emeralds lurking in my coat, but they felt as bulky as cannonballs. That's a great analogy. Everything correct? asked the official, blowing dust off his glasses. Everything correct? I didn't know who he was exactly, but he looked important. The property seems unnecessarily vast, Senor Machado. Yes, the official replied with a chuckle. Our misfortune is that there is so much cactus land in California that the governor has trouble giving it away. The moment this rancho was available, I petitioned for it in your name. So that must have been our friend Captain Gallows talking, and he's saying it seems unnecessarily vast. That's a surprising comment, right? Like it's too big. Why is it so big? Unnecessarily big. And the official says, yes, we're having trouble giving the land away. There's just so much of it. What happened to the owner? Colonel Roberto, the Englishman. Caramba, his own Indians had turned on him. Another of the Indian rebellion, rebellions, everyone is in a temper these days, and him a loyal citizen of Mexico. We had almost forgotten that he was an Englishman. Our, and you, you cannot receive a grant of land if you are not a man of Mexico. Your letters assured me, sir. The mission will have my records. I was brought here as a child on orders from the Viceroy of Mexico himself. That should qualify me. Ah, yes, the poor orphans, given away like unwanted puppies. You have risen in the world, Captain. You have not used my true name. You have not revealed it to me, sir. The grant is in the name of Captain Alejandro Gallows. That will serve. You understand you must live in this house, this hacienda, standing on your grant, and you must stock your land with cattle to hold your title. Now you might remember from social studies that, that was true, right? You could get a land grant, but you had to promise to live there and work the farm, work the ranch. I have already deposited funds with Judge Bomba, my agent of many years, to buy 3,000 head of cattle. So great a herd to start, replied Senor Machado. 
You will make Don Simplicio himself jealous. May the fleas of a thousand dogs live in his beard. I remember the man well, said the captain with a cold shrug. The official straightened his round shoulders. Now you must throw stones into the four winds and declare that you are taking possession of El Rancho del Soledad. There we go. Sorry about that. Captain Gallows scratched around in the dirt until he had found some stones to his liking. Then, as hard as he could throw, he cast one north, one east, one south, and one west. With a small private smile, he said, I take possession of El Rancho Candelario. So, remarked Senor, Senor Machado, making a note. Named for your wife, Captain? The captain did not answer. The seaman and I looked at one another. If the tall Mexican had a wife, he had kept it a secret aboard ship. So he named it El Rancho Candelaria, which is a beautiful Spanish name. Um, and they're wondering, who's that? Who's he naming it for? The official smiled and shut his soiled book of documents. The land is yours, Captain Gallows. Watch out for horse thieves, mountain lions, Americans, bandits, fleas, Indians, and your fellow Mexicans. Suerte. That means good luck. Buena suerte. Luck, replied the captain, smiling. I prefer to make my own. The men led their rented horses to the well and began to fill the dry horse trough. I poked around under the I poked around the abandoned ranch house. Here and there a small lizard scurried out of the way like dust come to life. I paused to look through the window openings. Thieves had evidently carried off everything they could carry, including the window glass. The rooms were bare and lifeless, with walls a foot thick. What was the captain going to do with so many empty rooms, I wondered? One could get lost in there. This is probably looking a lot like the rancho that we visited in Vista, right? For the moment, it was good to feel solid land under my feet again, and even to sniff some dust in the air. I found myself watching the waves as they flung themselves uselessly against the cliffs. They burst like pottery great visual. Same as me, I thought, rushing eastward, but stopped by these infernal Mexican cliffs. A sound inside the house caught my ear. Did a door slam? I turned and looked down the long veranda that ran along the south side of the house. I wondered if I had just heard the sea wind banging a door, but I went inside the house to look around. I glanced at the white stuccoed kitchen and the adjoining rooms cobwebs hung like wispy ghosts from the ceiling beams. As I wandered along the gritty plank floors room to room, I saw that my shoes were leaving footprints in the dust. And that's when I saw other footprints, smaller ones. Someone was in the house, someone in bare feet. I opened another door and peered into a room with a shelf load of books scattered to the floor, evidently tossed aside as useless to the thieves. Footprints led my eyes to a pile of rubble, ah, where part of the roof had caved in. The cobwebs looked as if they had been roughly swept aside. As I approached, a figure trailing cobwebs rose like a jack-in-the-box from the fallen roof tiles. I fell back astounded, as if confronted by a real ghost. But it was a girl, and very much alive. She was yelling like something untamed and frightened. Ay, ay! She burst past me, her bare feet flying. She was wearing a rag of a red dress and shell bracelets. Like a surprised mouse, she was out the door and gone almost before I could get over my astonishment. She was shrieking in panic. I rushed after her. With the same sudden amazement, the captain and his men turned to see the girl as she burst outside. They spread out to stop her, but she dodged one and then another. It would have been easier to catch a wild animal. Puka Puka waved his tattooed arms wide to block her way. She darted under them, her eyes flaring white and terrified. I see no, I see no, she was yelling. 
What was she screaming, I wondered. It sounded like assassins. Assassins? Quiet, child, commanded the captain. No one is going to murder you. The men closed in and trapped her finally. The captain began talking to her in Spanish. She interrupted. Oh, asesinos. I read it wrong. Sorry. Assassins. She flung out her hands as if to strike him and then went limp and fainted. Captain Gallows caught her. He picked her up and turned her turned to carry her out of the sun and back into the house. That's when I saw a small Indian woman wrapped in a shawl standing near the wall. She extended her arms. The captain shook his head and carried the girl into the kitchen. So she was offering to take the girl, I'm guessing. He says, no, I've got her. I watched as the captain and the Indian woman talked rapidly in Spanish. The girl came to and wrapped herself in a tight ball. The woman, who later turned out to be her aunt, managed to calm her. It was clear enough that they had been living in the deserted house, hiding from murderers and assassins. The captain told them that they could safely stay there. He offered to hire them and any other Indians who might be hiding. He intended to bring the rancho quickly back to life. On the ride back to San Diego, he recounted what the older woman had told him in Spanish. A rumor had sprung up that the Indians on the rancho were planning an uprising. There were 60 or 70 of them. They would kill the Englishman and steal his cattle and sheep, all of them. Dios mio, somebody did. She crossed herself a dozen times to tell me that it wasn't the Indians, but tempers caught fire among the Californios. They began hunting the Indians like wild animals. These revolts and chases have happened before. The young girl who was 11 and her aunt had survived at first by hiding in the ocean waves. Then they crept into the house. They've been hiding there since last winter. The captain turned his head to make sure that I was following close behind on one of his rented horses. Don't let that beast run away with you. Have you ever ridden a horse before? No, sir. Hold the reins higher, tighter. I saw the captain was keeping me always in the corner of his eye. The jewels had shackled us together. So you know what shackles are, right? Chains, like being shackled in a prison. So the jewels have tied them together and they can't be apart because, of course, he wants to keep an eye on his fortune. So... We've discovered a couple of new characters in that chapter. And that was the end of chapter seven. Join me next time for the next part of our story. Thanks for listening.